<laughs> via telephone. <laughs> Kelly Allen, Executive Director of the West Virginia Center for Budget and Policy. Kelly, good morning. How are you? Good morning, gentlemen. Thanks for having me. It's wonderful to have you on the program. Once again, uh, we have been going over this report uh, moving upstream, improving child welfare in West Virginia requires addressing root causes of hardship. And uh, there's some horrifying numbers in here. Uh, Kelly, who did the study at the, at the institute there? Or the I co-authored it with our summer research fellow, Veronica Whitico. And what was the inspiration for doing this particular study? Well, I mean, there's been a lot of news around West Virginia and your part of the state in particular about the really untenable flow of kids into our foster care system and how, you know, shortages of CPS workers, backlogs in our courts uh, is impacting our state. And we really went into this research asking the question, you know, we know that West Virginia has a significant number of kids going into foster care. And what is it that makes West Virginia such an outlier? Uh, some of the data that you referenced, we send four times the number of kids into foster care as the nation, uh, and we're almost two times as high as the next highest state. So there's no state anywhere on our level in terms of the number of families that we're investigating and sending into foster care. Uh, and we knew it's not that West Virginians are worse parents, right? So what's going on here? Uh, and the answer that we really found is that all so much of our policy making is focused downstream. Uh, there are a lot of supports in West Virginia that we withhold from families until they're in crisis, until kids are in foster care. Uh, we also found that most kids entering foster care in West Virginia are doing so, at least in part, due to parental substance use or neglect. Uh, both of those are really deeply intertwined with poverty. Uh, and we also found that um, we can address these things and even prevent these things through systemic supports. I'm because sorry, Kelly, parents, could, not to interrupt, yeah, could you re re repeat that statistic then, that are tied the, to uh, substance abuse? Yeah, so the majority of kids entering foster care, about half are due in part to substance, parental substance use, uh, and about a third are at least in part due to neglect, which is really intertwined with poverty. You know, if a, a family is at risk of being evicted, can't afford a coat, can't put food on the table, you know, is that an uh, unwillingness to do so or an inability to do so? Hey, by the way, to our audience following along on uh, Facebook, I have uh, linked this report and pinned it in our comments section so you can access it that way if you're listening on the radio or watching on TV 10 you can go to our comment section on uh, Facebook where we uh, broadcast the show live as well to, to get that uh, that study okay uh, Bill go ahead well no I was just looking at the numbers uh, this is Kelly it's a uh, uh, I've just had a chance to scan at a couple minutes before we went on air today, and I'm like John Gelstrap. I was blown away with the mm. with some of the numbers. Uh, I come from the scientific community, and uh, and our publications before they're published are peer reviewed, so someone with critical eyes have a chance to look at it. And if there's a problem with data accumulation or data uh, copulation, it is generally flagged. My question, was this report peer reviewed? And if it was not peer reviewed, do you think that the statistics will stand up with a rigorous challenge? I think so. So we actually had a couple of folks from national organizations, uh, one Child Trends uh, and another called Chapin Hall, who are really respected national uh, researchers on this particular issue, on the child welfare issue, who provided reviews throughout the process and feedback. Uh, we also um, had a couple of folks within the health agency. I don't know if they would want me to name them. They didn't want to be acknowledged. But uh, actually reviewed copies uh, uh, of this before it was published. So we had probably five to six external reviewers throughout the process. Are so, there specific data points that you're concerned about? Kelly, no. your, your, your cell yeah. uh, number, uh, is, you're starting to kind of flag in and out oh, there. Shoot. So. Yeah. Now, some of the thing, uh, some of the points that I looked at and was surprised. Uh, West Virginia sends far more children to foster care than any other state. We practically double the next state, and that's Alaska and or Montana. Uh, another one is that uh, we have a large percent in uh, uh, in group homes or institutions, uh, substantially larger than that of the U.S. Uh, we uh, we send a lot of them are in. 
relative homes. And you alluded earlier, it's a, a combination of things. One, the parent drug abuse was a big contributor with neglect and child behavior problem falling down. Uh, the uh, legislators have taken a real interest the past year or so in child, child welfare, child care. I assume this report will be referred to the legislators if it has not already been done, if it's not already done so. Yeah, so we uh, were at legislative interims last week and shared this report with a lot of lawmakers. Um, and I think, you know, lawmakers have really focused on child welfare as an issue in foster care, but largely a lot of the focus has been downstream, you know, how we can support families once uh, children are in foster care, uh, how we can get more foster and adoptive families, and that's really important. Uh, but I think our findings from this research were really that we will not stem the flow of children into foster care system until we uh, offer the same supports to biological families before they're in crisis. Uh, now, a study published in the American Academy of Pediatrics found that states' total spending on things like cash assistance, child care assistance, Medicaid, is inversely associated with all child maltreatment outcomes. In other words, states that spend more on prevention have lower rates of child welfare involvement. Uh, Commissioner Pack from the DHHR said the same thing in front of lawmakers last week. As a state, he said if he could wave a magic, magic wand, it would be to invest in prevention services. And quite frankly, universal economic supports are prevention services. Uh, and those data points you mentioned earlier, I think, you know, uh, as a state, you know, there are, are federal lawsuits and things involved around the number of kids we're sending into group homes. And um, at a national level, folks are widely aware that we have, you know, a lot more uh, a lot more kids going into the foster care system than the rest of the country. Uh, I think it's it's been news and eye opening to some to some folks here. But yeah, there's you know there's something different going on here in West Virginia. And again, it's not that West Virginia parents are worse. Uh, oftentimes, it's that we have fewer supports. Yeah, <clears throat> this is John Gilstrap. It, it it's got to be more than that. Uh, looking at this, you know, normally we, we see West Virginia is, is, is not a big performer in a number of, of different categories, but it, we usually talk about, you know, 75% more, 26% more, whatever the, the numbers are. West Virginia families, according to your report on page eight, are 2.3 times, 230% of the, uh, over the national average or national numbers to refer a child to uh, uh, welfare, 3.2 times more likely to be investigated, and 4.6 times more likely to have an, a child enter foster care. These are orders of magnitude. This is, um, it, it's, if it's not bad parenting, and it, it's, it can't be just downstream services, you're not concentrating enough on upstream services. Do you have any idea what, do we have, do we have for example, 4.6 times the number of addicted adults here as the, the national average? Do we know? Well, we do. Uh, obviously, we've been harder hit by uh, substance and opioid use than the rest of the country. So I'd like to bracket that and put it aside for just a moment, if that's okay. Sure. We've also got, uh, you know, we spend less as a state on economic supports. So we've already talked about that a little bit. But I think another piece of it, too, is what are we doing uh, up front in terms of, like, how we define uh, neglect, how we, uh, what, how we react to families if there is substance use or uh, reports potentially. Uh, and West Virginia is uh, one of about half the states that don't have something called a differential response pathway. And I think this is a big piece of the backlog in CPS. So about 29 states have this pathway where if there's a family reported uh, for potential maltreatment, but it's found they have a really low risk of maltreatment. Uh, instead of being referred to investigation, they're referred through this different door, this differential pathway, uh, where they receive supports instead of investigation. Uh, now, in West Virginia, you can only get an investigation or no investigation. So I think, you know, these low-risk scenarios where a family might need referral to substance use treatment, a family might need referral to supports to help, you know, keep the lights on or not get evicted, we don't have an alternate pathway for those low-risk um, families to go through. Uh, and I think that's a really important piece of potentially addressing, um, addressing this backlog that you all are seeing in your part of the state. Uh, and then again, I think the other part of it is around like how we define in code um, things like, uh, you know, what constitutes abuse and neglect. You know, in West Virginia, uh, a positive drug screen is considered 
uh, grounds that a child's in imminent danger and could be removed from the home. Now, in some cases, you know, maybe that's the right thing. In some cases, maybe that child's not in danger, uh, and really that parent needs referral to substance use treatment. Uh, one of the findings that we had in the report was around there being very few substance use treatment uh, opportunities or beds in West Virginia where the child can visit, where there's parenting skills uh, alongside substance use treatment. And I think, again, we've got to get out in front of some of these things and make sure that folks have more access to treatment and we can kind of stem what's happening uh, with a slow of kids into foster care. So you, that's a few pieces of it, I think. Yeah, a couple of specifics you mentioned is that as uh, SNAP go, uh, support goes up, uh, the uh, reduction in CPS reports goes down. In other words, there's a direct inverse correlation between those two. Another one you mentioned is with the uh, uh, the uh, the temporary assistance for needy families. You, uh, mm -hmm. West Virginia provides zero. The nation average is 9%. So those are two examples, both of which are upstream support for the family, which West Virginia appears to be lagging. Now, West Virginia does spend TNF, uh, temporary assistance for needy families uh, on, on some cash assistance. It serves very few families. But that stat that you referred to, uh, we don't put any of it towards tax credits. Like, we don't have a state-level child tax credit or an earned income tax credit. Uh, and, we're yeah, we're behind the rest of the country there. Uh, and I want to say that's important because parents who experience economic, uh, material economic hardships, which is referred to as difficulty, you know, paying the rent, paying medical bills, paying for food, are three times more likely to be reported for neglect and four times more likely to re be reported for abuse. So there is a real research proven, evidence driven connection to economic security uh, and child maltreatment allegations. So the more we can be doing to make sure people don't have those stressors of not knowing where the next meal is coming from, not knowing how they're going to put gas in the car, not knowing where uh, they're going to find child care so they can get to work. I mean, those have proven, proven reductions in allegations and instances of child maltreatment. Kelly Allen is our guest from the West Virginia Center for Budget and Policy. She is the executive director. Kelly, is there a baseline pre-COVID to be able to compare these numbers to your most recent study? Yeah, I mean, so we're comparing states during COVID to states prior, uh, also during COVID. So I think that controls a little bit. But um, I mean, the rate in West Virginia has really gone up dramatically over the last decade. Between 2012 and 2021, uh, the number of kids in foster care in West Virginia went up by 57%, while our population went down by about 4%. So I think um, like like lots of things, uh, it continued to go up during COVID, but this was this was a crisis prior to that as well. We know in previous interviews with Seth from your office, Seth Stefano, that he was not in favor of the tax cuts. He wanted that uh, surplus money directed toward what he regarded as some of the greatest needs in the state, including mm -hmm. uh, the foster care situation. Is there an amount of money that you feel that the legislature should be setting aside to help alleviate these foster care and child poverty issues in West Virginia? Well, first I'll say that uh, some of the programs in which we're being fairly stingy are federal dollars. SNAP is completely federal dollars. TANF is mostly federal dollars. So some of it's, you know, <laughs> allowing these federal programs to serve as many uh, children as possible. But, um, you know, we, we were opposed and concerned about the income tax cuts because largely, you know, I think one out of every $6 of the income tax cut will go to the top 1%, and about two-thirds of it will go to the top 20%, if I'm remembering that correctly. Um, I, I mean, if we would have spent that same amount of money, that $800 million on, you know, a child tax credit, every family would have gotten a couple thousand dollars per child. I mean, there are just ways to more equitably get those resources to the families that need it the most. Uh, but again, too, what you're, to your point, you know, that tax cut came at the cost of additional investments in um, supports for families, in uh, child care subsidies in food programs. So, you know, that was that was the choice that was made. And again, you know, the data shows that the more a state spends on economic supports for families, the lower the rates of child maltreatment are. So, you know, when we talk about the trade-offs of tax cuts, I mean, that's really what we're talking about, well-being of kids. Kelly, so if, if, if some of these programs, as you mentioned, and we know SNAP and TANF are federal programs, is the state not distributing the money properly? Because it, West Virginia certainly gets its share of federal dollars. 
Well, I think the state just has flexibility in how they administer the program. So, for instance, TANF uh, is mostly federal. Now there is a state match. We have some of the harshest TANF restrictions in the country. So we take TANF away from families if the parent doesn't meet pretty harsh uh, work requirements. We also uh, recently began uh, taking TANF away from families who refused suspicion-based drug testing or failed uh, a substance use test. Um, and those are, you know, those are among the harshest penalties of any state. Uh, so, you know, the evidence really shows if we uh, allow more families to, to access those programs that um, child maltreatment allegations and, and instances would be reduced. And, you know, it makes sense to me. I know I have a two-year-old and I know I'm a, a better parent when I'm not stressed out. So um, I can imagine what really, really big stresses like not knowing how you're going to pay your rent. Uh, might cause for parents. Kelly, trying to put a more positive spin on this, looking at your numbers, the uh, far and away the largest contributor is parent drug abuse, 50 percent. Mm -hmm. uh, we are getting a, we're the recipient or beneficiary of a large drug settlement that will be coming back to the counties. Uh, once this money is being utilized uh, by the counties, by the state uh, for to address the drug problem, would you anticipate that our numbers will change? Well, I think it depends on how those resources are allocated. I mean, the biggest recommendation we made around substance use in the report was ensuring that uh, families uh, could access substance use treatment as a whole family. Uh, we talked about program, you know, there being a real lack of programs where child care is there, where the child can come, where there are parenting skills involved. So hopefully, you know, those dollars are distributed in ways that increase supports for families uh, and don't increase punishments for families because, you know, we know that doesn't work. Uh, but I think, you know, a finding also from the report that I was really struck by was um, when interviewing parents who had lost ch children to foster care in a study. We didn't do the interviews, but we referenced it in the report. Uh, often those parents themselves were victims of trauma, had you know significant ACE scores. So if we don't get support to these kids who are today's foster kids, you know, in a generation, they could be uh, parents who, who struggle uh, to care properly for their kids. So this is a, a really, really, really important issue to get out in front of. And I think you hit the nail on the head. We've got some uh, some dollars coming into the state that really, really should uh, ensure that families have the resources that they need and foster kids uh, or kids can be prevented from being foster kids in the first place. Hey, Kelly, let's go back to the basics on the um, within the report. Uh, a a ne neglected child is a defi is defined as one whose uh, custodian uh, or parent fails to supply the child with necessary food, clothing, shelter, supervision, medical care or mm -hmm. education. So necessary, who, who makes that determination of, it's, it's a relative term, so who, who makes the determination of what is and is not adequate when the standard is necessary? Well, I think that's a really good question. And, and one thing we identified in the report for um, investigators and even mandated reporters, there's a lot of subjectivity uh, in, in current code. Now code does say um, that, uh, you know, the parents, it shouldn't be because the parent is unable to provide it, but like that's a lot of weight on an investigator, a mandated reporter to say, oh, well, what is the reason that the parent is not providing these things? Um, so I think ex uh, making the state code more explicit uh, and making it clear for investigators, for mandated reporters, as well as, you know, we recommend putting into state code a requirement that if, if the thing standing between a, a child staying in their home is access to substance use treatment or an economic support, uh, we need to provide that support because, you know, at the current rate, there will never be enough CPS workers. There will never be enough judges and lawyers. There will never be enough foster families. Um, so we have to really, you know, disrupt this flow of kids into foster care and make sure that families have the supports that they need for the kids to stay safely at home, again, when it's safe for them to do so. Uh, and some of that is providing the economic supports that we would provide to foster families, hundreds of dollars a month, a month child care, all sorts of things, to parents before. Uh, before the child's in foster care. Kelly, uh, has, has your, num uh, 
report is your report regionalized or localized? Can you make the uh, determination if one section of the state is more mm. prone to this activity than other other sections? And the reason I'm asking that is going back to this drug abuse. Uh, the Eastern Panhandle, Berkeley County uh, in particular, has been very aggressive the last several years of trying to address the drug problem and how it affects families. So I just wonder mm. if, the, if our efforts are sh uh, paying off in any form whatsoever. Yeah, uh, that's not something we've done, but I'm very interested in it for a potential follow-up. So that could be something we could do going forward. And two, we'd love to you know, spotlight and learn about local programs that are going on, good things that are happening on a local level that could be either replicated in other places uh, or should just you know, uh, be shown off a little bit. So that's really interesting fodder potentially for some future research. Kelly, final word is yours. Well, I'll just go back to uh, where we started. You know, families that experience economic hardship are more likely to have child welfare involvement. Uh, the, the best thing that we can do is make sure that, again, families who need substance use treatment, who need economic support, have them. Uh, we, provide, we extend these supports to foster kids, foster families, and we need to extend them to biological families uh, to keep more kids safely at home. Kelly, thanks so much for your time this morning. Again, to our audience, I've linked this report in our comments section on uh, Facebook. Kelly, have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, thanks, Kelly.